In the discipline of art history, art historians utilize what are called methodologies to interpret works of art. A methodology is essentially like a plan or strategy. And we have many of these methodologies in our discipline, but in this online tutorial, we are going to work with two, formal analysis and iconographical analysis. And we're gonna utilize these analyses to interpret a painting by the complete and total boss, Giotto. Now, before we get into our analysis, I'm going to provide you with just a very little bit of context, which may or may not be helpful in your interpretation of Giotto's work. Giotto is a painter who painted in Italy during the pre-Renaissance. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at the interior of the Rena Chapel. It's technically, it was known as the Scrivegni Chapel, named after the chapel's patron, Enrico Scrivegni. But it's more casually referred to as the Arena Chapel because right next to this structure is an old Roman amphitheater that dated to the first century. So as you look in, you can see that this chapel is adorned with these gorgeous fresco paintings that pretty much cover the entire surface area of the interior. So, so gorgeous. Now, art historians are pretty united in the argument that this is Giotto's most significant contribution to art history. And I myself am in total agreement with this. I cannot emphasize enough how important the paintings included in this chapel really are to the development of painting, particularly as we're transitioning away from the late Middle Ages to um, the Renaissance with this kind of intermediate period known as the pre-Renaissance. Now, what I say is that what makes Giotto so important is that Giotto pretty much essentially one man on his own, a trailblazer, the vanguard of his time, one man ushers in the entire Renaissance. Now, that is a bold claim, and I'm aware of that. But let me explain to you why I'm making this bold claim. We're just going to do a quick comparison before we really get into the nuances of Giotto's work. So you've got two works of art here, one by Giotto and one by Duccio. Giotto and Duccio actually studied under the same teacher, this guy who's known as kind of like the father of Italian pre-Renaissance art, particularly in the Italo-Byzantine style. His name is Cimabue. And Duccio and Giotto study under Cimabue. Duccio pretty much just like replicates the style of his teacher. And Giotto goes in a complete different direction to pretty much make the most contemporary, cutting edge, avant-garde paintings of the pre-Renaissance. Now, the situation is this. Throughout the Middle Ages, okay, roughly a 1,000 year time period, art really was subservient to communicating religious message. The religious messages really were the most significant component to the artwork. And a lot of the ways in which an artwork were put together were done in a way to help facilitate this function. So when you look at Duccio's work, compare it with Giotto, right? First of all, we can see a very different use of color. So you've got this gold in here, which is highly typical of the Italo-Byzantine style. And basically this is a carryover from the Byzantine style, which emerges in the history of art in the sixth century. So all this gold here is meant to convey an abstract spiritual space. It removes the scene from this realm of man, the natural world. Now Duccio does kind of take a step forward by including trees, but that's pretty much it. Now, if you look over here, you see this blue. The blue actually is really cutting edge because what Giotto's doing is he's actually bringing nature. He's bringing um, the natural world back into the subject matter of art. This hasn't been seen for hundreds and hundreds of years. So the blue sky, and you can see a little bit of trees in the back here, this return to the natural world, this will presage what happens in the Renaissance. And this is a huge focus of the Renaissance, is the natural world and man's experiences within this realm. 
The other thing that we see is we see that um, Giotto is really bringing back emotion. So also in the Middle Ages, we see kind of this marginalization of emotion. Not really frequently are we seeing emotion being expressed in art. And again, this has to do with the idea of the religious messages really taking forefront. The idea is that for religion, okay, people are considered to be part of a collective, a group, rather than, you know, really nurturing individuality. And so we don't see a lot of concern with individualism during the Middle Ages. Now, if you think about it, the expression of emotion is something that's highly individualistic. It indicates very different ways in which people will respond to different situations. And it also is something that's very, very personal. And so, for example, the sense of emotion, take a look at the kiss, right? So we've got this kind of like awkward sort of like side kiss on the cheek, maybe mouth situation happening here. We're not really seeing a lot of eye contact. There seems to be a little bit of a psychological separation um, between Judas and, and Jesus. Where here, oh my gosh, this is so powerful. You've got Jesus and Judas just like staring right at each other. Judas is like puckering up to kiss Jesus and Jesus is just like calling him out just simply by looking at him, right? And so you can get this sense of tension, this sense of psychology that's happening between the two here. This type of intense psychology, we have not seen this truly in the history of art since all the way back in the Greek Hellenistic period, which is hundreds and hundreds of years prior. So this is very exciting. You get a sense of action, a sense of movement, a sense of energy, a sense of vitality, where here there's just something about this composition that feels more static. Now, this idea of, of life, of energy, of vitality, this idea of the individual experience, these also become foundational to the Renaissance. And you can see how this is something that Giotto really is um, sort of nurturing in terms of the works of art that he creates. Now, of course, I can go way into this, but I've already kind of gone off on these tangents. The whole point of this tutorial is to show you how to use formal and iconographical analysis, um, not to really celebrate how amazing Giotto is, which is something that we should be doing all day, every day, anyhow. Let's move on. Okay, so let's say that um, we want to provide a formal and an iconographical analysis of this piece, okay? Now you are watching this tutorial um, in preparation to write your paper on methodology. Now you know for your paper that you're not permitted to do any outside research. The idea is, is that you're just going to try to come up with the loosest interpretation um, that you can from using these um, methodologies. So in the end, we're going to just have kind of this sort of rough idea of the content of this piece. I um, am not sure about this particular biblical narrative, so I too am kind of engaging in uh, this exercise alongside with you. Now, one thing that I think would be helpful is for you to kind of participate in this tutorial by trying to, you know, do these analyses on your own. And we can then sort of compare our findings uh, after that. So you've had two readings that you've been assigned. And one of them is the Getty website on formal analysis, where you were reading about formal elements and design principles. So you want to make sure that you've read that. And then also you can go to the online symbolism dictionary. And that can be your source for your iconographical analysis. So what we want, what we want to do is this. Um, we want to take a look at this painting and see if you can find formal elements or design principles, two or three, and then see if you can also find symbols. Now, I chose this painting on purpose because I have a feeling you're going to look at this and say, there's nothing here. There's no symbols. And so this is a great way for you to practice really looking carefully at a work of art. There's actually quite a few symbols if you really, really closely look. So what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to pause the video, look very closely at this painting, which appears at the outset to be very simple, but it's not, it's complex, and see if you can find some points for formal analysis 
and some potential um, symbolism in this piece as well. So pause the video, come back, and let's compare our findings. Okay, so hopefully you did that. So let's compare. So this is what I came up with. Now, first of all, okay, let's start with formal analysis. We know that the steps of formal analysis are describe, analyze, and interpret. Now, when you're writing your paper, you're not going to have enough words, right? You know, you're limited on your word count to kind of go through these steps one after the next. So what you can do and what we're going to do here is you can conflate the first two, describe and analyze, right? So we're just going to, at this point, do the first two steps of formal analysis. So first of all, let's start with line, okay? Line is a, is a favorite uh, formal element that students like to use. I'd like to remind you that you are not permitted to uh, double dip, okay? So this is really important because this can affect the, your score on your paper. If you talk about line, you can only talk about line once, okay? Now there's all types of lines, right? We've learned about implied lines, right? We've learned about um, different qualities of line, okay? Now I'm gonna say this, and this is important. If you use implied line, you have to use something um, other than focal point for your formal analysis, right? Because implied line really does kind of create focal point. So I'm considering that to be double dipping. And actually, I'm not gonna address implied line. I'm going to um, address two different types of line. Um, but in your paper, you don't. You only have to, to address one if you're going to work with line. So first of all, I see a lot of analytical lines in this piece. We know that analytical lines are sharp, straight lines, and you can see them all throughout here, right? Now, we know that analytical lines give a sense of severity, a sense of seriousness. Sometimes they can function to emotionally alienate the viewer because they're so rigid. Now, I also see some diagonal lines. Now the diagonal lines, they do have the function of kind of suggesting perspective. And I'm using that word very cautiously because technically Giotto didn't invent perspective, uh, but we do see certain types of perspective pre-existing. I would say this is kind of a loose usage of intuitive perspective, which we've seen all the way back in um, ancient Roman mural painting. Despite that, the functional nature of these diagonal lines to suggest the recession of space, we do see that they are technically diagonal, and you could probably make the argument with other evidence that these also suggest tension, right? Diagonal lines can suggest tension. So the lines already are making me feel like this is kind of a serious situation. Now, of course, I can take a look at the title, the expulsion, right? This guy is getting kicked out. And you can certainly use a title as like a clue to help you with your interpretation. Okay, so this guy is getting kicked out of a temple. Um, obviously, this isn't like a super happy situation. So this tension that the line is suggesting seems to be appropriate. So this is the describe and analyze, right? I've described in analytical and diagonal lines. I've analyzed why Giotto may have chosen to use these, right? Because nothing's an accident, nothing's a coincidence. He's trying to suggest a sense of seriousness. I'm going to stop there. I know that it's really tempting to move on to the third step, but we're going to do that at the very end where we bring it all together, the formal as well as the iconographical analysis. Balance. I love the design principle of balance. So with balance, if you kind of just like draw an imaginary dividing line down the middle, you want to see if there's an equal distribution of visual weight. Does the piece feel equally heavy on both sides? Now, my answer to that is no, because you have this like large architectural form. You have this tower that kind of comes up. On this side, you have this empty space, right? So this is all full of um, objects. This right here is empty, and that creates a sense of imbalance. Now, um, what if we go to analyze, what that tends to mean is that, um, or what it tends to convey is again this idea of tension. People like things to be balanced, they like things to be evenly distributed, it makes them feel comfortable. And when things are kind of like off kilter, it makes the viewer unconsciously feel uncomfortable. Now, of course, these are generalities, right? If you're thinking, oh, well, I don't feel that. Well, you might be an outlier, right? But in general, 
this tends to make people feel slightly uncomfortable. Now let's talk about color, okay? Now again, you need to be careful with color. You don't wanna double dip. I'm gonna use color for my uh, formal analysis, which means I cannot use color as a symbol. You could use color for a symbol, it certainly has symbolic meaning, but that means you would not be able to use it in your formal analysis. So the color, right? So blue is a cool color, right? Now we know that blue um, visually recedes. It gives a, space, a sense of depth or a sense of space. We're gonna leave it at that. We'll attach meaning in a moment. And then scale. This one's kind of interesting, I guess. Um, I put this one in here um, because I'm thinking about this idea of the, the building, right? Buildings usually are large in size. They dwarf the viewer. Here, um, these people really are almost the same size as the building. So the building actually doesn't have that, that large of a scale. Okay, so this is our formal analysis. Let's move on to um, iconography. So these are the symbols that I saw, okay? Now, one of the things about iconography is you can have one symbol that has multiple meanings. So you do have to be very critical when you utilize this um, methodology. You have to think about what seems to fit best, okay? So to use the online symbolism dictionary, right? So I saw, okay, he's holding a lamb, right? It's a cute little baby lamb. So I go to the online symbolism dictionary and put an L, find lamb. So what I found when I looked it up is lamb can symbolize sacrificial animal. It can it actually it signifies all sorts of things. Gentleness, innocence, purity, sweetness, forgiveness, meekness can represent the pure thoughts of just man. Okay, so I'm gonna keep that in mind. And I'm not really gonna like commit to a symbolic meaning until I kind of look at all of the symbols together. So I saw a halo. Okay, halo um, is a religious symbol. It represents divine power and also could suggest wisdom. Now what I also noticed is this guy's wearing a hat. Now here I have to be careful because we've got, this is technically a hat as well. So this would be double dipping to talk about both. You could talk about both, um, but that would only count as one symbol. And a hat typically represents authority or power, which we're gonna see this a million times in this class. Anytime you see a hat, take notice of that. That is potential for iconographical analysis. Now all the guys are wearing beards. These are big beards, big bushy long beards, which I looked that up and that represents manhood or wisdom. So I don't know if you've noticed this, but wisdom keeps coming up, right? And the halo comes up in the beard. So I'm gonna take notice of that. Now, another thing I noticed, stairs, which, you know, cause it's random. These are like stairs of nowhere, right? Why does Giotto just randomly put in stairs? Nothing's random. I looked up stairs and stairs signify a connection to heaven and earth. They can also represent a spiritual passage. Now, if I had not used color in my formal analysis, I could maybe even put blue in there. So blue represents the spirit and intellect. It also can represent sky, heaven. And if it represents sky and there's no clouds in the sky, you know, think about the quality of the sky, it can represent truth, loyalty, and fidelity. Let's bring this all together, okay? So, Here's this guy, and I'm gonna go ahead and assume he's the one that's getting kicked out because he looks really sad. I'm actually kind of sad about this. And this guy looks like he's like pushing him away. He's rejected, dejected, this cute little lamb leaving, right? It's just kind of sad, it's a sad piece. Okay, so he's getting kicked out, okay? Now, I don't know why he's getting kicked out. There's not enough visual information, but with these clues, I might be able to kind of make an interpretation. Now, I do know this is a Christian image, right? But let's pretend like I don't know anything about Christian imagery. Not everyone is automatically uh, knowledgeable in the beliefs of this religion, okay? So I don't know anything. And I cannot do research. That's considered cheating at this point. So he's getting kicked out, why? Okay, so let's go back and let's look. So we've already kind of determined that this is kind of like not a great situation. There's some tension. This is very serious. One does not arbitrarily get kicked out of something, right? He's getting kicked out for some sort of serious situation, right? Now, there's some tension. 
um, that's involved with this expulsion, and that's being indicated through the line. It's being indicated through the uh, lack of, of balance. Now, notice what I did here. This is really important. You know, I'm, I'm using what I see in this painting to um, evidence or support my interpretation, right? He's getting kicked out. This is serious. The lines, the lack of balance indicate this, okay? Um, now, in terms of why, okay, what I think is actually him getting kicked out, even though this is really a, obviously a hard and sad thing for this person, that he that this is part of God's plan. So what I think is that this person went to a temple to make a sacrifice. And I'm saying that because the lamb symbolizes a sacrificial animal. Now, I can also going to say that this person in a way is sacrificial in a more figurative way because he's sacrificing his feelings, his sense of belongingness for whatever God's plan is, right? God is wanting him to be kicked out. And so in a way that's a sacrifice that this person may or may not be willingly um, undertaking. Okay, so I'm kind of looking at sacrifice in a couple different ways. So he's getting kicked out, it's part of God's plan, right? And we know that this guy's special because he's wearing a halo, right? So God has special plans for special people, he's wearing his halo, okay? Maybe this guy is the one that said, kick him out, right? And we see because he's wearing the hat. Well, they both have hats on, right? So these are the men of authority. They're kicking him out, right? Now the beard, right? Wisdom. So they all have beards. They're all wise, I suppose, to some extent. Um, but this idea, we see wisdom really, I think, focused here symbolically because we know that the halo represents wisdom as well as the beard, right? And so maybe this guy is special because he's wise or he, through his wisdom, he somehow knows that he's meant to be kicked out of this temple. Even though it hurts his feelings, he's still um, willingly putting himself in this situation. Now, I need to, the problem here is I need to defend this idea that this is God's plan, right? Because that's what I keep saying. How can I defend that? And guess what I can, okay? Here's how. The stairs really, to me, is what brought me to this interpretation because this idea of connection, connecting heaven to earth, right? God is involved in this. He's overseeing this. We see the connection here. Now we can reinforce this idea of God by the blue sky because it can represent heaven. It also can represent the sense of spirit, right? So this idea of the sky is the realm of God. Now this idea of truth, of loyalty, of fidelity, this man is willingly putting himself in this situation because he's faithful to Jesus, he's faithful to Christian teachings and Christian ideology. He's loyal to God and this idea of truth, right? That this is what God wants, that, that there's a truth to it, there's a, a significance, right? And so, you know, bringing it all together, it's this idea of, I think, God's divine plan, uh, one that we really cannot understand and that some times might not be very comfortable or enjoyable to experience. So this is our example then of forming a loose idea of what this painting might be about using these two different um, methodologies.